third and final panel, uh, we spoke about the role of education, uh, business, and now it's the role of universities. And to do the honours, I'd like to introduce the moderator, the chair of the session, uh, Professor Eric Bergloff. Eric is director of the Institute of Global Affairs, and in many ways, uh, I guess my spiritual leader and academic leader, certainly in the construct of this event. So over to, to Eric. Well, thank you very much, Lutfi, and, and um, when we saw what uh, Lutfi was trying to do, so, so I'm uh, heading the Institute of Global Affairs at, at LSE, and when we saw what uh, Lutfi was trying to do, it was very much in the spirit of, of what we want to do. We want to be part of mobilizing faculty, mobilizing students, getting people connected to LSE from the outside and connecting LSE to the outside. And when I came here, I, I didn't know what to expect, really, and you know, I, I knew that would be a lot of interesting contributions, but I, I didn't expect to be as touched uh, as I have been by the different stories, by Fadus, by uh, Hanan, by all the uh, individuals who have, have come here and, and shared uh, with us. But actually, the thing that was most touching for me was uh, naive, because I brought Naif to an event I organized three or four years ago when I was at working at a, a development bank uh, here in London. And um, he gave this wonderful presentation about you know, this meeting with Obama and the meeting between the Superman and the 99 and, and so on. And I had no idea what he has had to go through between that time, three or four years ago, and what he has, uh, uh, you know, where he is today. And I think... Uh, I think Naif is no longer here, I, he left, but, but... Oh, you're here, great, wonderful. I see you now. And so, so um, thank you, Naif, for sharing that, and, and uh, you know, we, we are on your side in, in, in this, and, and, and thank you very much. So, so, um, so when I came to, to LSE and, and to, to build this Institute of Global Affairs, you know, I was thinking about issues that would sort of be ripe or ready for um, an institute like this, again, trying to connect faculty and students to the, the global challenges. And, you know, this was two years ago, there was no issue that was bigger then, and I think there's no issue uh, that is bigger now than migration in Europe. And again, we shouldn't talk about the crisis, but it's something that is affecting so many. I'm Swedish, uh, I can tell you that almost everyone in, in my country has been touched uh, by uh, migration, and I know it's true in, in, in Germany and much of, 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 of the rest of Europe. And uh, we, so we wanted to do this on the issue of migration. We, we went around LSE and we found uh, more than 50 now faculty who works on, on migration. Most of them didn't know about each other, and uh, now People outside didn't know so much about them either. And, 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 and it was, it's been a fantastic group. We have done uh, some really exciting things together. But what we also saw was that really LSE couldn't meet that in incredible need for facts and research in, in the, the public debate. Because I don't think there's any issue where the distance between where the debate is and where facts and research are. And so we wanted to do more than that. So we started an alliance of leading universities on, on migration. We started with uh, nine universities in, uh, in Europe. But we also realized, you know, talking to these universities, and it was, for me, a fantastic experience to, to call around and, 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 and get uh, the, um, you know, hear from the universities how much it had affected them, what people were doing at universities in um, here comes our missing speaker, so I don't have to filibuster any longer. <laughs> no, but, but uh, you know, when I called around, I was really struck by what students were doing, what faculty were doing, what universities were doing uh, in general. I called to Mannheim, you know, they had uh, taken many lecture halls to, to house migrants. Students were renting uh, or, or collecting used bikes so that migrants would, would be able to to, to uh, enjoy uh, the city and, and get around uh, uh, in, in, in the city. 
Central European University in, in Budapest, you, you, as you remember, Hungary was one of the countries that really resisted uh, this. And, and they felt like an island that of, toler of tolerance and, and, of course, beyond tolerance to try to engage. And, and, and they did, and, and they shared these stories with us. But what really blew me away, and that's why I'm so glad that, that Nasser is here, and please join us on, on stage here, was when I, when I called AUB, because we wanted to go beyond Europe. We thought that, you know, we have to go, we have to connect to the, the parts that are so much more affected than, than we are. And, and uh, that's when I first spoke to Nasser, and Na Nasser shared with me what he has done. Nasser is from American University in Beirut, and of course Lebanon has been the country, probably in the world, that has been most affected by what's happened in, uh, in Syria. And, uh, you know, they have more than one million refugees in a country of four million plus. And uh, it was an opportunity f for us to, to learn about what they have done, what they have done to open up, to reach out uh, to so many uh, aspects of, of the uh, migration. So I'm going to give you, in a minute, give the floor to Nasser to describe what they've done. But I also want to share with you why, why we have two more panelists here. Because, you know, the second day when I came here uh, to set up this Institute of Global Affairs, I was taken to a room with um, uh, Angelina Jolie <laughs> and William Payne. And uh, they were here to start a center on women, peace and security. And, you know, that was very exciting, but you sort of thought, you know, I'm an academic, so, you know, what, what, what is this all about, all this uh, uh, publicity and so on. But then I met Christine, and, and Christine, she adds the depth uh, to this center and the uh, academic seriousness, the connection to the, the real issues. I think she has done more than probably anyone to change how law is taught, not only in this country, but in, in general. And uh, she has built, she's building a center that I think symbolizes a lot of, of what, uh, what we're talking about, what universities can do to, to uh, reach out uh, in, into uh, uh, a very difficult space, which is a, very much about what happens to women in conflict and in, in post-conflict situations. And, and then as, as, as a bonus, I, we had Madeleine Reese, who is uh, an activist in an institution, she is uh, the director general, is that the term? Secretary, Secretary general of, uh, of the uh, Women International, which is, she will tell us uh, more about in a minute. But uh, uh, I've had the pleasure, be even before I joined the LSE, to work with Madeleine and seen her energy and her uh, commitment uh, to the issues of, of, of women uh, in all around the world. And I had the pleasure of spending uh, an evening uh, discussing with her in Pretoria, where she now lives uh, a few weeks ago. So please, even though you are the, the man on the panel, uh, Nasser, I'm going to give you uh, the, the, the first Thank you. floor. They're okay? This? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for being a bit late. Uh, I tried to raise all the uh, uh, transportation delays in London. Actually, tolerance. what delays me? What That's delays when you me? really need tolerance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and... Um, uh, actually, I, I spent a couple of minutes at the uh, border uh, force now, they call them border force. So the lady asked me the usual question, what do you do? I'm a professor at university, what do you teach? I teach policy and development, I actually graduate from LSE. And why are you here? And what do you do exactly? They're actually now persistent on the borders, they want to ask more details. And I told her I work on refugees. So actually she started that we have a lot of refugees in Britain. Well, we don't have a lot of refugees in, in Britain. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling she would return, she would you know, return me uh, to, the, to the next flight to Beirut. I said, we're actually hosting 1.5 million in Beirut for a country of 4 million. If those were to come to, to Britain, you can do the math, that would be something like uh, 15 or, 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 or maybe uh, 10 to 15 million uh, refugees. I think uh, Britain has been, uh, has been uh, you know, in a lot of discussion around getting the children from, from Calais. So, uh, so actually there's some lessons to, to learn from what's going on in the bordering countries of, of Syria. And I think uh, it's a message of, of, 
of reality and I will tell you a bit about what we're doing but also perhaps we need to send a message of hope that things can work in in uh, not so functional governments, not so functional states, so I think they can work everywhere. So we shouldn't fear uh, having more migrants and more refugees. Maybe it's not the right moment now with whatever is going in the world, but we, should, we need to maintain this. Uh. So I'm, I'm actually a graduate from LSE. This building wasn't there, it wasn't here when, when I was at LSE. And, uh, and I've been working with refugee issues. Uh, Lebanon, before the Syria crisis, hosts uh, something like 250,000 Palestinians. We shouldn't forget about the Palestinians in Lebanon. Uh, those are protracted refugees that suffer a lot in Lebanon due to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, being uh, uh, thrown away, thro thrown out from their country in 1948. So, uh, and, and, and because the Lebanese government is, isn't a, a, a good host, particularly for Palestinian refugees and fearing the sectarian balance in the country, they've been treated so badly for many years. So there's a country with, with, with a history of refugees and not always doing well in that regard. So when Syrians came in, uh, you know, I started to ask myself this question. I mean, how this country is coping? Well, how we're coping with 1.5 million? That's one in four. So if you walk, one in four is, is, a, is a Syrian refugee. And to add to them Palestinians and, and some other smaller population, I think the numbers are huge. And we started looking into understanding this phenomenon, you know, and, uh, and the government was dysfunctional. We didn't have a president until last week. For like two years, we didn't <laughs> manage to elect a president. And the parliament was almost, you know, locked, uh, uh, effectively locked, not meeting, not issuing any decree. So in, in this context, we looked into the uh, the role of you know uh, informal networks informal mechanisms as well as quasi formal like community groups community organizations as well as the un ngos and others and 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 largely the refugees in lebanon have been doing and and I'm, i want to be cautious here doing you know okay in terms of for the last 6 years that the country hasn't exploded and they've been managing in a way or another, because of a lot, because a lot for the, the role of the informal mechanisms and the way communities themselves have been organizing, you know, and, and contributing to their own livelihood, as well as the Lebanese host communities. Just to give you some numbers, 70% of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon are below the poverty line. 54% depend on food uh, assistance, you know, they get a food basket every, every month from the WFP. So they are actually the poorest. Those who were better off came to Europe. And, and that's also something we need always to keep in mind, that those who are better off have money, connections, speak the language, educated, actually uh, came to Europe. And those who were the worst off stayed in the neighboring countries. Uh, so, so that's what's one thing you need to, to keep in mind. And 86% of them, who are very poor, live where most of the, where 67% of the poorest Lebanese are. So it's actually the poor are hosting the poor. So whenever you speak, you know, hear about middle classes, you know, uh, uh, nagging about uh, immigrants and refugees, it's actually the poor who, who host both of the time, the poor. And that's something perhaps to, 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 to reflect on about all the uh, rise of anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiments in Europe and the West. Again, I mean, that's, that's kind of a quick context. I know we don't have a lot of time. But then in AUB and my university, the American University of Beirut, we've been doing a lot of work on refugees, Palestinian refugees and then Syrian refugees. And then came to, we're starting to hear a lot of what's going on in, in the university. Across the three you know, functions or vocations of the university, research primarily, but also community engagement or services to the community, as well as teaching and providing scholarships. And then you start to hear, you know, this is working on this project, and, and this is collaborating with the UN, another with the, with the university in Europe, and, 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 and. So we thought, I mean, why not do a quick mapping to understand what's going on? And that's how it started. And we realized there was something like, at that time, around 30, 35 projects, and now they're around 40 to 45. So we have 45 professors or departments actually engaged in, in the refugee crisis. So we looked at them into the dis different disciplines, by health, like the typical UN sectoral division, health, education, social cohesion, and, and others. And actually, there's a, a critical mass in certain areas, particularly in where we target vulnerable groups like health, education, and uh, child protection. Um, that's, that's fine. We said, okay, but then 
I, I started you know, discussing it with colleagues and we brought it up to the provost and the president of the university who actually liked this idea of bringing those people together. This is where we created or we started this AUB for Refugees initiative. And we didn't want to do a program or center because centers and programs and institutions are territorial by definition. You know, they, they will put people, uh, uh, you know, exclude some people from. So we thought let's put this as an initiative where those 40 plus academics and, and professors can come in and work under it. And we actually uh, took kind of a hands-off approach. We said, we're not going to take on your work and say, this is our work as AB for refugees. Keep doing whatever you want to do, but let's create some synergy among each other. If someone working on health, nutrition, medicine, why not come together for a joint work? If others are working on education and well-being, why not consider this also as a joint work? And it's working. So this has started last August, September. So we're just, you know, in, a, in, a, in an early stage of this. In addition, we thought we'll keep this initiative to look at the overall, you know, work of the university and give it a an, an address, an umbrella, or a brand, if you wish, where anyone would know what AUB is doing goes to this AUB for refugees, rather than create a center or an institute. So uh, that's how it started, and now we're moving into discussing the pathway for pathways for higher education. Th only 3% of the students in Lebanon are actually in universities or have university at, at university level. Uh, again, back to that, most those who are educated are actually being picked from the uh, resettlement countries, and particularly European and North American, or actually those who managed to come to Europe. So. We, through, with, with working with some foundations, we're trying to work for scholarships like uh, MasterCard Foundation and others to, to give scholarships. But again, there are a lot, a lot of issues around scholarships for, for the refugees because they sometimes lack the language, but mostly their, their education is not compatible to universities like the American University or LSE, for example, or others. So you need to do a lot of preparation for them that might last one or two years. And there's also the psychosocial support that we are working with certain units in the university. But, but, so but that's kind of an overview. And, and, and this is the other branch of the work under, you know, that we're, we're looking at or we're coordinating now is the work with the community engagement, the community service, where students are engaged in service learning, uh, um, you know, an approach for service learning through their courses or some work like a project or something with the Syrian community. So one group of architect students just built a public library for Syrian kids in Bikaa in the eastern part of Lebanon. Others are working on renovating schools and so on. So we're trying to encompass all of this through the... But, but I mean, universities cannot do... A, 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 you know, and, and, and I'm being reflective on this, like solve the problem. But they can contribute a lot through the dialogue they create, through the knowledge they produce, but very importantly through the narrative of hope. I always say this, we need a narrative of hope because there's a lot of negativity in, in, in when we talk about refugees. Refugees are burdened, refugees are uh, dirty, immigrants are rapists. This is what you hear in the media, right? So you need to really always create this narrative of hope that many refugees are doing well in a way. Others are co working collectively to help each other and self-help mechanisms. And others need help, but we need, you know, to to support them in a way that they become maybe some self-dependent at some point. So refugees are not always a burden as we might see them, or they're really, you know, uh, 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 depleting all the resources in any country. But definitely they need help. But in a way, we need to help them so they can become uh, uh, self-reliant on for for their livelihood. Thank you, Nasser. And and that, yeah, as I said, you know, when I first saw all the things you're doing, you know, getting involved on in renewable energy in, 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 in uh, refugee camps, law courses for refugees, all this is really uh, in incredibly impressive. So I want to shift a little bit now to, to, uh, to Christine because I have the pleasure of having the office next to Christine. <laughs> so I, I overhear every conversation that she has. <laughs> and and, 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 uh, and, and uh, on, on top of that, I see all the energy that uh, she generates in, 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 uh, in the office. And, and uh, she has these uh, resident scholars, but she, and she has even uh, resident activists. Uh, and uh, she's started a new course uh, here. So I, I wanted to, to see, get your, Christine, your perspective on, on you know, what can universities do to reach out, and it's not only about refugees, but really 
reach out to, to uh, engage uh, with these uh, big issues. Thank you. Um, and I also hear your conversations. <laughs> Two-way two -way thing. Um, NASA has just given us a really good as, as to what universities can do um, when you have a refugee population right literally there in the way that you've said. Um, and I mean, apart from anything else, that dispels the myth that we have a big refugee problem. Um, but I think what we try to do more is look the other way, to say, try to have more understanding about you know, why is there such a large refugee flow, particularly with respect to women and children. And one of our major um, ways, I suppose two things that I really want to say on that. One is this real issue of trying to get a greater understanding of the incidence of sexual violence and armed conflict. So many of the people who are fleeing um, are fleeing from appalling forms of sexual violence. They are not people who are coming, you know, as we get in the Daily Mail, you know, the scroungers, etc., etc. What they are doing is fleeing very real forms of not just the bombing and so on, but also forms of gender-based sexual violence and the need to understand why that happened. Why do we now accept that that is a tactic of war? What are the appropriate responses to prevent and protect? Women, Peace and Security, our centre, has four pillars, and two of them are prevention and protection. And I think to try and understand those issues are absolutely vital. But I would also, so just two other points. Um, Matt and I are, to some extent, a bit of a double act, uh, long-term working together. So um, usurping your role, Eric, sort of will sort of come over. But sort of, I think um, two other really important points. I'm a lawyer, and I do think it's really important through our courses, through our research, through our teaching, to develop ideas among students as to how law can be both an instrument of resistance and an instrument of... In, of constantly showing how particularly human rights law can be used to address the many issues that are raised through migration, through refugee flows, through asylum claims. Um, I've had students working recently on producing a systematic analysis of what are the obligations on states, on international organizations, on um, private organizations with respect to the refugees that they have. This is not an issue of welfare or um, it's an issue of legal obligation and we need to really use human rights law. That starts through teaching. It st starts through research. It starts through sort of pushing out further. And then the other point I was going to make, it also starts with working with, you were talking about working with various organisations. Um, what we try and do in the centre is work a great deal with civil society organisations, women's non-governmental organisations. So to support their work, to feed into, to work as a dual team in many ways, which is where I turn, if I may, sure, <laughs> sure. To, to Madeline. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, well. Thank you, because this is part of the double act. <laughs> the, um, because for almost 20 years, I think it, it is, be, yeah. I have been using and abusing Christine's brain on how to actually get law to describe the real experiences of the women that I've been working with in places like Bosnia and now more broadly. Um, because I'm also a lawyer, um, but my frustrations with law were that if we were not able to use human rights law to adjust the way and approaches that were made to law, we were going to end up with the sorts of issues that we have in relation to prosecution of sexual violence, the inevitable consent coming up, the way women are treated during the entire process, and that all of those things then are inimical to being able to give the sort of protection that is demanded by human rights law, by other law, but we can't achieve it unless we start joining up the different parts of the framework of law, which means looking at social economic rights. So what I was constantly doing was seeing it was not working but not being smart enough myself to know how to make it work, I'd run to Christine and say, how do we do this? It's not working. How do we change it? What are the dynamics? And because of having an academic institution with a clout of the LSE, um, 
we were able then to start shifting the discourse in several areas, on trafficking, on sexual exploitation, by peacekeepers, to come up with legal frameworks which would then more accurately reflect what was actually happening to real people on the ground and who were trying to achieve some form of justice. Um, of course we're not there yet, because the institutions that we work with are highly patriarchal still. They still adhere to systems which are discriminatory on multiple grounds. And I think we've seen now how the... And I think the refugee issue has been one which has shown dramatically how ordinary people responded with incredible humanity mm. and wrong-footed governments and institutions by the responses that they had. And it took a lot of fight back by the governments with the likes of the Daily Mail and other populist um, newspapers to, f to create the fear factor again so that people pushed back. Whereas, in fact, the reality of the refugees was very, very different from the one that was being described by the media. And, but that pushback had an effect. And instead of looking to the real experience of the refugees and accurately describing it in law, we've now done the reverse. So we now need to push back, and that's where the universities come in again, to show the facts of migration, the facts of asylum seeking, the facts of being a refugee, and then what it means. And I, one example I would give is... is the absolute need to put the, the, the participation part of women, peace and security front and centre of that because we can't talk about refugees. It's refugees who have to explain to us who then have to have the response as to what it is that's wanted. You talk to most Syrian refugees throughout Europe, they don't want to stay in Europe. They want to go home. It was the same with the Bosnian refugees. They don't want to be in perpetuity outside of their country. It's the same with women who've been trafficked who were accused then of seeking to lie about their traffic status in order to migrate. Well, no, most migrants want to go home. If you look at, the, if you actually do the analysis of what happens, most people stay home. Most people want to go back home. Most people want to earn money, then go home. But we don't hear that part of the narrative. And that, I think, is fundamentally lacking. And the problem we have right now is that um, facts, evidence, research, mm. analysis is now old-fashioned because it doesn't matter. It's now how you feel. And this is the pushback, I think, and a challenge to the universities is to make sure that the information we've got can then be translated into ways which actually does that empathy thing and makes people respond in a way which is helpful and supportive and gets us back in touch with our humanity. And we're not quite there yet, but... I am optimistic. Good. Thank you so much. I, I want to, we, we should conclude, but I just want to invite one or two questions here to, if you want to. One. Okay. Yes, okay. Can, can you give her a microphone? Yeah, I'll take that back. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I left it. Hi, um, my name is Rana and I work with the migrant community in bringing over children from Calais for the past year with the lawyers. So I was helping the lawyers facilitate the process uh, for Deuce here as well. I, that's how I knew her when I arrived. Um, anyway, I was just wondering, have you ever thought of, because I'm also a mediator, and I always thought, how amazing would it be if universities started getting the Syrian community together in the UK, in exile? It could be you know, very private, nothing on TV, nothing on record just to talk about conflict and mediate the conflict and come up with some practical solutions. If the university can be a platform for this, it would be ideal. And then it's obviously passed around as policy advice, maybe for the government, uh, putting it forward, et cetera. H have you thought about doing something like this? Yeah. Do you want to take any more, Eric, or should we? Well, if, if there's one more, we can. I mean, this, I think, is a, a very important question and, and something that certainly we have thought uh, quite a lot about, and, and, uh, and of course there are initiatives like that. There has, for example, been a, 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 a group created, uh, Staffan de Mistura created this group of, of, of women advisors and actually involved some LSE faculty in, in, in that uh, process. But maybe Christine, Mar who, who wants to go on, on this? I'd, it's <laughs> well, I don't, go on, you can go. I'll do a quick one because I, I'm not from university, but one of the things that we have been advocating is that the, the need to bring the Syrians together to design their own return program. Um, you know, so that basically they...
do want to go home, but it's not good enough to do what they did in Bosnia, was scoop everybody up and dump them back at Sarajevo Airport with nothing. You know, so, and essentially, it's a highly gendered process. You need to have the inclusivity. You want to make sure that you've got the social economic frameworks in place. But that's got to be done by them, for them. And you know, the work that we're doing is to try and link that to the work that's being done in Syria at grassroots level now, particularly by women, on reclaiming bits of territory through the governance structures, insisting on the human rights frameworks. And if they can be linked, then we can actually get the views from the diaspora helping to recreate uh, a new environment. And it, it'll be cheaper for governments, because then it's, there's no unnecessary duplication, there's no dumping of money, go build this. You know, it's, it's actually designed by people for themselves. And I think that would be an extremely good way mm -hmm. of, of using the resources of the university. Mm -hmm. No, I think you've said it. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. I think you have got some sense of what, what universities are doing and what they could be doing, and of course what organizations like, like uh, Madeleine yeah. is doing. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Can I have a 30 seconds as well? Yeah. 30 seconds. Uh, just as a, a point of, uh, of concern, uh, universities shouldn't be uh, seeing refugees as a subject for research. Um, I, I get a lot of uh, invitations or uh, ideas about, uh, you know, research. Some of these are really fascinating, but others are, you know, just uh, not acceptable. So, for example, and excuse me if there's anyone who works <laughs> on mental health. I mean, mental health for refugees, I mean, what do you think? Of course there's mental health problems for refugees. Those who left their homes, lost their family, maybe they got, you know, uh, sexually abused. I mean, uh, definitely there are mental health uh, issues. Unless you're doing an evaluation for intervention, you'd rather not spend the time and money and, and, and do the, re the research. And, and don't use a model that you apply for those who are actually break up from a relationship <laughs> and a Western model about PTSDs and for refugees. Of course, they, their, their mental health is very, very challenged. Absolutely. So uh, and this is just an example, maybe there are others. But some specific research related to issues of uh, interventions, whether programs are working, uh, whether capacity building can work, um, how we can rebuild Syria and the return to Syria, I think can be really uh, uh, very effective. But not, let's not do the voyeurism in research and working with refugees, because that's sometimes universities tend to do and researchers tend to do. Can I just take, and I think what you've just said is especially important in the context of sexual violence. Yeah. Um, it has to be so very careful. I was just going to make two more, uh, two more points about what universities can do. We can provide um, the tools, yeah, and open up where the tools are that can be used in the various programs and so on. And I would just make one, I imagine this has been said during the day, um, we shouldn't be being tolerant all the time. We've got to be empathetic with the right people. We've got to be angry and angry at what is going on so often. So don't let's get too obsessed about being tolerant all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So, so uh, thank you so much. I think you have given us a, a lot of, of, of ideas of, of what can be done and, and also what to watch out for in, 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 in uh, opening up and, and, and studying also uh, uh, the refugee and migration issues. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Eric. <laughs>